everyone, and welcome to Talking Out Align, a show, as you know, about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, where we'll be exploring these topics in different industries across the United States. In today's episode, we'll be exploring gamification and DEIB. Our special guest is Perry Clements, who's an educator and creator of Inequalityopoly, which is an adaptation of Monopoly, where you get to experience what it is to gain wealth in America based on different identity groups. Clemens is an educator who hopes to educate students, families, workplaces, and everyone in between on the problems that come with having different cultural backgrounds and the gender discrimination individuals face in the United States. In this game, each player is assigned one of eight different characters at random. You have the chance to play as either an Asian, Black, Hispanic, white male, or female. The idea for this game came from sitting through many diversity and inclusion training sessions where he realized that the people teaching them had a really hard time transferring those statistics into something people could relate to and understand. With these trainings being important for companies to build inclusive workplaces, Clemens decided to take the initiative and create a product that could be used to involve not only the corporations, but the people in them and make it interactive and fun and something that people could really understand by letting them be in the shoe of their co-workers and members of their community. So the teacher that Clemens is, he understands that the easiest way to teach something is through games and making those statistics come to life instead of keeping them uh, numbers on a page. Similar to what education shows for kids like Sesame Street do, he's found ways to make learning engaging and entertaining to everyone without making it feel like a task. Inequalityopoly has three years of research behind it, making all the statistics, facts, and playability as genuine and thorough as possible. Yeah, and we both have played the game and we know exactly that the way in which at least it was for me, uh, it was fun and I learned the process and learned so much data of how, what it is like to be uh, different identities in the United States and how that impacts our wealth building in such a fun and interactive way rather than just sitting down and reading a dry article about it. So gamification has become an important tool that companies utilize in today's society to teach and train their workers in everything from diversity to productivity to employee engagement. As always, before jumping into the interview between me and Perry, let's look at the statistics about how gamification and DEIB have impacted corporations in America. Gamification has started to grow more and more throughout the years. Since 2016, the gamification value has grown from, hear me out, $4.6 billion worldwide to $11.9 billion in 2019. That's more than double. Now, 70% of global 2000 companies use gamification in some way to train their employees. In schools, over 60% of students agree in how gamification has helped them be more engaged and motivated in classrooms, which many times translates into them being more engaged and successful. The idea of having games and interactive activities helps employees and students alike retain information through having to use it firsthand. In one case, an elementary school math teacher saw test improvements of 34% after only four months of implementing games into her teaching. 80% of US workers believe that game-based learning is more engaging and effective too. The uh, results are not left out and the impacts are not left out on the adults of the US as well. For adults, the most effective strategies in gamification seem to be level uh, progressing games, points and scores, competition, and real-time feedback. The countries that have been utilizing games to teach employees the most are Western European countries, Eastern European countries, African countries, uh, the countries in the Central Asian bloc, and North America. And if all these statistics aren't enough to convince you that gamification is truly a great tool that has shaped many companies and pushed many employees to be more efficient, it's proven that 83% of employees who undergo gamified training are more eager and motivated to work. You know, everyone can think back to the days uh, back in school when the teacher planned out an activity. The competitiveness, quick decision making, and memorable moments always helped you retain that information a lot better than just taking a few notes and dozing off during lectures. You know, no matter if it's a corporate setting or an academic environment, everyone loves games. Enjoying your time and learning at the same time 
uh, it definitely seems like a win-win. So thank you so much, Aiden, for providing uh, a nice introduction for Perry Clemens and Inequality Opoly uh, to our audience. Now uh, we are going to move into the segment that Perry uh, spoke with me and engaged in the game of Inequality Opoly with a whole bunch of volunteers to uh, demonstrate to you how interesting and engaging it can be uh, when we uh, use the method of gamification to talk about serious issues such as diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in US society. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome Perry Clements, who's the founder of Inequalityopoly, uh, an adapted version of Monopoly that looks at the field of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging and turns it into something that families and schools and workplace environments can play at their own time and learn about all of these issues in the United States. All right. So, Perry, tell us a little bit about yourself and your game. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I... Um, create in Guayapoli because I went to a lot of diversity trainings and I realized that the trainings were very important, but not always made in the most engaging way. And as an educator for over 15 years, I know how important it is to gamify topics to make it easier to understand and relate to. So I embarked to um, uh, make in Guayapoli into an uh, experience so that people can see how it is to be a woman, a person of color in America trying to accumulate wealth with all the obstacles of structural racism and sexism. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your research process, because a lot of times people in the world of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging um, are going out into the field and doing the work, uh, but, um, but however, they're not backed by a lot of research, which I think is a really strong in your game and your approach to doing work on this field. So tell us a little bit about that and the background of the process. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so I think it's really important to include actual data in this game because there's so much amazing research done by these amazing researchers around the world, around the country, about um, racism and sexism on these topics. But to be honest, these, these papers are rarely read, are rarely in the news, rarely kind of absorbed by people. So I thought it'd be cool to kind of take these, these data points and put them into a game. So the game is based on probabilities so that you have to roll a certain number to, for, to something for, to, um, to attain for something happening to you. Like for example, you have to roll a certain number to get your mortgage approved. And that number is based on national recent studies. So every, everything in the game is based on some sort of study um, to really make it, to really ground it and make it so that this is an actual experience. This is not just someone, you know, showing an inequality. This is actual inequality that exists and it is recorded. Sounds good. So tell us a little bit about the positive reception, some experiences of where you have shown it, who has played it, and the audience that this is uh, intended for. Yeah, well, I mean, this is a game that I'm very proud of. People not only play um, as a diversity training tool at their offices, but people also take home to play at their family reunions, to, to play with their families. And I really think that's amazing because this, these messages need to go not only in the corporate rooms or in classrooms, they need to be in dinner tables as well. Sounds wonderful. Uh, so can't, uh, can't help but ask considering how polarized our US politics are on issues of inclusion, diversity, equity, and belonging. So I wanted to know what has been some pushback and some experiences on people who have uh, not seen the value in this work or been threatened by it, whichever. Yeah, well, well, yeah, well I had a lot of pushback, especially in the beginning of creating the game, but there was a quote that really guided me. Um, it says, art should comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. And I saw that the people who were criticizing me about this game were quite comfortable and not willing to kind of um, take a look at the inequities in our society. And those who were receiving the game were those who were the victims of this inequity. So I felt really reassured that people who were going through the struggle felt seen in this game. And those who weren't seeing this game didn't feel, didn't feel that they were seeing this game need to play the game so they could understand how other people lives are like. 
Great. Uh, well, my hope is that maybe 10 years down the line, when this becomes a thing in many more households around the country and around the world, that you would have a slightly more positive answer uh, when it comes to uh, people's reception of it across the board and that uh, allyship uh, between communities is built on the idea of understanding someone else's experience. So mm -hmm. hoping that people who are comfortable and who have faced less discrimination for the lack of a better word would actually have the ability to receive it and work with it to bring about social change, even if they're not, they haven't been the ones who have been at the receiving end of it. What do you think to that? Yeah, I totally agree. I think that the message is for everyone and the more the people who are or um, who care about it, that aren't experiencing it, the more it will change. Right, so tell me, this would be the last question before we actually delve into the game because I really want the rest of the folks to be really getting in and doing the work and letting the audience know how cool it is and how well you have adapted it using uh, research and um, a lot of imagination. So I wanted to ask you this, that um, what in your, um, worldview since you're the creator of the game would populations that have not been uh, historically marginalized get out of playing this game because this game is clearly uh, putting forth a narrative that may be unfamiliar to a lot of people what do you think it brings to that crowd of people well it brings to them a very individual understanding of racism and sexism because a lot of people think racism and sexism are these structures that i'm not part of it's just this, this structure that exists and I'm here, I'm just doing what I'm doing, and what I'm doing doesn't affect social racism at all. But this game shows that your individual choices are affecting it all the time. Um, it's just, um, you know, in so many instances, like whether you're getting your mortgage approved, whether if you are a, a man and you have to roll to see if you get sexually assaulted, you know, and you're more likely to not get sexually assaulted as a man, you know, just enjoying that not being sexually assaulted and then being like, oh, I'm not worrying about it. And because it didn't happen to me, that kind of experiences are something that people can take away from this game. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Perry, to give us an, uh, a sort of a high level look into the game and sort of the thinking behind it. So I want to get into uh, the game itself. So if you could please take the time to explain your game after I um, ask our dear guests to introduce themselves to us. So sure. please uh, let us know who you are, your preferred gender pronouns, and your affiliations. Hi, my name is Björn Nordfeldt. I'm uh, Fadia's husband. Um, I'm also chair at the Department of Education Policy Research and Administration at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I'm originally from Norway, um, and I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm excited to be here. How's it going? Uh, Aiden Fitzpatrick, co-producer at Talking Out of Line. I'm a communications uh, sports journalism major at Springfield College. Uh, very excited to be playing in a inequalityopoly today. Hello, my name is Alberto Martinez. My pronouns are he, him. I am a communications major at Springfield College, and I'm also a research producer and scriptwriter for Talking Out of Line. Hello, my name is Arshia Malik. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a co-founder of an HR tech company called Alaria, where we measure inclusion in the workplace. I've been a fan of Inequalityopoly for a long time, and I'm excited to be here today. Thank you so much, everyone. And Perry, please take on the floor and uh, guide us through the game. So we're going to start the game now. And before we start the game, you all are going to be randomly born as your identities. So once I click play, you're all going to be born as your identities. OK, so you can see identity, you know, see identity card. And then after that, you're going to start with inheritance rounds, where we're going to go through three rounds of inheritance, where each player is going to see if they inherit property. So during this time, this, um, when we are born, to say, I was born as this, say what you were born as. And then when we get to inheritance rounds, please let, you, let us know if you inherited property or not. OK, so we're going to start now. OK, I've been born as a Hispanic woman. Uh, I've been born as a white woman. All right. 
I've been born as Malik, a black man. I'm born as uh, Kai, uh, an Asian man. And I've been born as an Asian woman. All right, so now inheritance rounds. The three inheritance rounds are presenting the centuries of disenfranchisement for people of color and women of owning and sustaining properties. So this first round, I did not inherit property. Did anyone else inherit property? Yes, I did. I did. As a as a Bajoran, as a um, Hispanic man, woman, I did not inherit property. Yeah, I'm at the second round. Nope. First round, I inherited a property. And what's your identity again? Black man. Black man, okay. So no inheritance. I have no inheritance either. Aiden? Uh, not the second round, but first round, yes. Okay. And the third so, round. For me as a white woman, I've got three out of three. Wow. Three out of three what? Tell us a little bit, Alberto. I got three inheritance. Uh, I looked at it pretty, pretty good. Um, and you can see them across the board. All right, so I got no inheritances at all. As a Hispanic woman, I got no inheritances. Um, this is because in the research, um, Hispanic people are most likely to get denied for their mortgages, which obviously makes for that, that property not be inherited by the descendants. Yeah, I, I got, um, oh, something happened. I all, right, so now, all right, so now um, then I land on a great uh, life event space. This is the Great Recession card. So everyone has experience in the Great Recession, but depending on your perceived identity is different for different people. So if you saw that um, Black people lost $400, Hispanic people lost $300, and Asian white people lost about $100, and everyone lost their job even though we're not employed yet anyway. Um, Aiden, it's your turn. Can you right. pick the dice in the middle of the board. I can't believe I don't know, own any properties at all. All right, so Alberto, you landed on Tangerine's place. So you do you wanna buy this property? Um, uh, yeah. All right. So you can now roll to see get your mortgage approved. So, and what's your identity again, Aiden? Uh, Asian man. My Asian mortgage man. Okay, so was I, approved. Okay. <clears throat> so what is the um, what what's the probability on mortgage approvals for uh, so man's Asian males? Yeah, for Asian man, the uh, mortgage approval. You look here. We can see the um, identity card. Oh, wow. Okay. Identity card here shows we can look on um, item 12, which shows the probability of, of, of getting your mortgage approved. So you have to roll less than eight to get your mortgage approved. So each player card actually tells you probabilities and uh, unlikeliness of mortgage yes, probabilities. That, that's a big, um, actually, I think it's your turn. That's a big thing that difference that makes this game different than Monopoly is this game has a identity cards, like the cards you're dealt in life, right? That dictate exactly. so much in your game. They dictate your salary, dictate chances of getting your mortgage approved. And the problem is in real life is that people don't know these numbers. A lot of people don't know that actually because you're of your identity, you're this less likely for something to happen to you. So this game kind of illuminates that. So Arshia, you landed on some property and you paid some rent. Huh. You landed on my inheritance. You want to go That's pay. cool. I like that. So, so, cool. you're, so you're receiving money on your first turn, you're receiving money from inheritance, not from anything you've done you know, in this life, right? It's the hairdresser's mm -hmm. money from inheritances, which shows how wealth is built, right? Yep. I like this. For real estate. Okay, I rolled five. Where did I go? Uh oh. So oh. you land on the police interaction space. Oh, so good. you have to roll the dice to see if you go to prison industrial complex. Oh, no. And what's your, what's your identity again? Black male. Okay. 
So, so good let luck. me let me check what's going on with police. I'm worried now. The dice. Oh, you got away. Yes. Love to see what? when um, we don't go to jail. So you you what beat was the case. The, what was the number that Bjorn had to roll in order to get sure. away? So I'm quick one here on mine, and he had to roll less than six, which uh, we know on two dice, seven is the most likely thing to roll. So it's really hard to roll. So you roll less than six, which is good. And then if you become a next convict, then you, you have to roll less than four to avoid um, prison industrial complex. Because as okay. we know, if you are ex-convict, getting out of jail, the recidivism rate is so high that within three years, mostly most, um, not most of it, but I think it was in the ex convicts go back. And this is showing because when you are leaving as, as convict, it's so much harder to get a job, harder to get your mortgage approved, to get a, to get a, a rental house to live. And all these things make it harder and harder for you to make a life for yourself. This research, uh, it seems so extensive. How did you, how were you able to gather all this? Was it, it doesn't seem like an easy task for just for Yeah, the it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. It had no. a lot of research, a lot of spreadsheets, a lot yeah. of information, a lot of things, a lot of playing with it. Because um, I mean, I feel like every aspect of the game uh, requires completely different knowledge on the inequality. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's because it's it's so it's so pervasive. Like, I mean, when I started this game, I thought it'd be you know not so not so extensive, but I learned every part of our life has so much inequity to it. Even utilities. At first, I had utility space, which was a regular utility space with the land on it. Got to pay for utilities. I did some research. Surprise, surprise! Black people and people of color pay a lot more for utilities for a lot lesser services. Oh wow! Flint, Michigan is a perfect example of that. And I didn't even think that, that inequity exists, but it does. I just got out of, away from a jail situation as well, and I'm wondering what my number was that I had to roll. Oh, sure. So you click click on the I on your um, avatar. Yeah. On the top right. And then you can see. Less than 10 or 12. Oh, that's the wrong one. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, Arshia, uh, what's, yeah. your, um, uh, what's your avatar? I'm an Asian woman, so I'm going to guess I had to roll much a much higher number. <laughs> okay, so someone got denied for their mortgage, so now this goes up for auction. So everyone's bidding on the property to see to, to purchase it. And this goes to show that if you can't buy a property at the best price, like gain and mortgage approved, buying it at an auction or competing with other buyers makes it really difficult. So I'm it's another way it. that... Another oh way that um, it was made difficult to build wealth is just trying to acquire property. <laughs> so right. for me, it's a white so Perry, war here. So Perry, <laughs> tell me a little bit about the Green Gardens Organic. Well, I mean, so that's the thing in the board. There's um, The board is made in a rainbow pattern from yeah. red to, um, <laughs> to, um, to pink and going from more expensive to least expensive. So the properties get little, little by little more gentrified. So you see here, there's an organic store there and next to it, there's a coffee shop, you know, and all that kind of shows how your area is changing, right? right? And also you see on the property card, there are, um, you can't see it very well, it's kind of scrunched, but there's a neighborhood, there's identities about the neighborhood as well. So not only do you care about the rent, how much it costs to buy this property, but also what's the neighborhood like? What's the employment rate in the neighborhood? What's the school spending in the neighborhood? Where are the environmental um, hazards in the neighborhood? These things are important because they affect us so much. Environmental racism is very prevalent. So on the property cards, I also put in the state of the neighborhood, right? Is this a neighborhood you do want to raise your kids in? Um, because these kind of things are affected. And think about someone who has to live in a neighborhood where the schools aren't so good, but that's all they can afford. Absolutely. Yeah, I wanted you to uh, shed some light on the um, organic and privilege and environment and social justice uh, intersections, because that's part oh, of no. my and my work. Yeah, and the food the deserts, right? So many denied. food deserts where there is no organic food, right? So there's a... a um, but plus, there are surplus of food in some areas, but in other areas, it's a food desert. 
Absolutely. All right, so we're back. And so again, we see here in the property cards, this one is alliterative, it's lemon lobs. So this is the most valuable property in that color group. Okay. No one's backing so, down on this auction. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and the costs are going way higher. Listen, if you purchase cost because so, my mortgage was denied. Exactly. So now you gotta pay out the pay through the nose. Oh, now God. in the game, you can go bankrupt. Like in America, you could go bankrupt. <laughs> like in, in the capitalist society, you can go with almost unlimited debt. Well, like Same thing. organic salad garden. What? <laughs> you got your coffee shop. That's good. I'm happy about that. But Kevin, if you like spend all your money, you won't be able to buy any property. You only be able to buy, pay for rent. As a person who's bankrupt, all you can do is pay rent, and that's all. You can't oh, no. build any well. All right, my turn. Roll the dice. Right, that was quite a bidding war there. I was very high. <laughs> the bidding wars get really fun. Um, and so, in this Aiden, what is your identity? I'm an Asian male. So, Asian male. okay. Ooh, payday. I, so hey, this is interesting. I'm glad you landed on that because we have Asian male in the game, technically gets paid the highest of any person in the game, more than white man. But this is actually an anomaly in the studies because Asian, as we should all know, Asian, this is a sort of wide definition of what does Asian mean, right? What does yeah. Asian American mean? And so the studies that I saw have Asian Americans, Asian men had making the most money, but they also on average have bigger households. So if you are making more money, but your household is bigger because more intergenerational health and more living, then you're not really seeing all that money. Oh, so, wow. so really Asian Americans are probably making the same, maybe less than white men on, on average, um, taking, taking into consideration their family structures. That's so interesting. I hadn't thought of that. In my work, we're always talking about the difference between East Asian and Southeast Asian or, or South Asian experiences. And I, I hadn't thought about that. That's fascinating. Yeah, it's so just saying another, it's another thing I learned. Sorry. Another thing I learned was yeah. it was by skin color as well. The uh, how much Asian people were making was by their skin color. The browner Asians were making less, and the, the wider um, lighter Asians were making more which is absurd, which happens in the white, black community too, which is, you know, the colorism as well. The descendants of uh, colonialism. That's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> it's so true, it's so true. Whose turn is it? Um, our, it, our CS, your it turn. might be mine, sorry, I'm talking. All right. So I am an Asian woman, which is what I also am in real life, <laughs> <laughs> which I think the first time I played this game, I also got that. <laughs> You must yeah, be. You're... It's funny. I got that too when I played it with Perry, and it was a really silly moment where I'm like, "Oh my God, how did the game know?" I was... <laughs> yeah, really good AI. Was like, it was random. It was, the game didn't know I was an Asian woman. So one I, day, uh, technology be that advanced. I went to buy the oh. property and I got my mortgage. Congratulations! And you Congratulations! <laughs> Thank you. It's a fancy area too. Blue circle, fancy. Was the, uh, were, were any of these areas based off a certain um, city, rural place, I mean, uh, urban place, or was it all just made up? No, all just made up in, in a rainbow pattern, like a rainbow, I gotcha. like to a rainbow pattern, uh, of course, in solidarity, um, but also it just kind of gives a structure. Um, I thought about renaming them, like, you know, um, Harriet Tubman space, you know, stuff like okay, that. Yeah. I'm like, let me focus it on these topics. Maybe in another edition, I'll have that. Okay. I want to have it so that you're focusing on inequality. You're not focusing on, oh, it's probably, so that's why it's just red, red yellow, violet. Right. right so for like me, that. I just try to buy my second property. My first one, the mortgage got denied. What are the probabilities for a white woman? Uh, okay. To get All right. So why did I lose here? the money? 180. I lost 180. Oh, it's Alberto's. Uh, it's my property. It's my inheritance. Oh. Ooh, All right. Inheritance. Does that sound good? My inheritance. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm just my right. roommate had to had to roll less than um I 10 hope I'm getting a nice to room. The concept, of the, the concept of the odds and the dice 
um, relating the odds in real life is actually, in my opinion, really brilliant because it just makes that so much more tangible to understand um, the odds of, of being able to have some of these things. Thank you so much. That's not my wife's contribution. My wife, <laughs> that's my wife's idea. And I was like, oh, this is so brilliant. Yeah, um, yeah. we all really get that. Shows, it really shows a probability, you know. <clears throat> Been, and then everything, um, if you are unlucky enough to become an ex-convict, everything becomes too, too less probable to, you know, um, if it's less than six, you can roll, you can roll less than four. Um, so yeah, it's good. And it, it, it's, I think it's a good way of showing like, that's how the world is. Like you have these probabilities and you also have your own will that affects it too. You know, you can, you know, someone can, um, out of desolate poverty, you know, become a millionaire, become Ooh. successful. Yes, it's possible, oh, but the, the sure. odds of it are so low. And that's what these this myth to show. Yeah, and it kind of uh, breaks apart the mer the myth of meritocracy, right? You can't Thank always you. just work towards something and assume you'll get it. It's the odds are against you in so many ways. Yeah, and the compounding because then. This is the next thing about this game is that it's not only one thing against you because life event happens. Now you lost your job. And now a recession happens or a pandemic happens. You can't control these things. So when these things happen to you, um, they make whatever's already happened to you already even more difficult. So that was really great that we got a snapshot into the game. So Perry, tell us a little bit. Um, I think um, we will now move on to talking to you a little bit more. Uh, about the game and I would really love to know from the rest of the folks who are playing the game like what were their thoughts and reactions to doing this and doing it um, so that our audience understands the experience so Perry first tell us like where would uh, the uh, players be going how long is an average game usually between this many people well um, in, in Monopoly <laughs> in a quietopoly can go on almost forever this game doesn't have to have an end right now built in. It just keeps on playing for whatever time frame people have to, to for the session. Um, but I say um, a hour is a good time to just play the game and talk about the effects of it. And then the next time you play it, it's easier. You can just jump in and play for half an hour and play for play as a different identity. Sounds great. Sounds great. So tell us a little bit in the same order that you guys introduce yourselves. Um, what are your some thoughts and reactions about playing this game? My identity was black male. Um, that was quite interesting. Um, I got some inheritance. So I started well. Um, after that, I had some issues with police, um, but I got away from it. So I did pretty well. Um, my salary went up a couple of times, so that was good. And I managed to get three properties, but all <laughs> on auction because the bank was not very happy with me. Um, the bank quite disliked me. So um, all the stuff that I got was through, you know, hard work and uh, bidding. Bidding was with the others. So Perry, tell us a little bit about what Bjorn said. So here, Bjorn's avatar clearly had some inheritance, had got away from the police and um, generally worked hard, got uh, raised in, in his work. Why would a person who's black like that be, what, what would be the logical reason other than the logical reason of uh, racism be held, be, like what could you do on paper to hold a black man back who's clearly demonstrating all the right moves? Yeah, well, it's a great question about um, the mortgage denial. And um, it really goes back to credit. And when I was first creating the game, I um, wanted to put credit scores in the game. I was like, let me put credit scores in the game and let me make it so that everyone have credit scores because credit scores affect everyone. And I learned I didn't need credit scores. Your race is a proxy for it, right? So I can just use your race and that's your credit score. So, and let's go back to credit score. Credit scores are very opaque. We don't know what, what makes our credit score go up and down. A lot of people don't know. And if you are paying rent, then it doesn't go to your credit score at all, unless you don't pay rent and your landlord reports you negatively. But if you're paying mortgage, it's always reported to the credit agencies. 
So there's so many different ways in which black people and people of color aren't building credit and don't have access to the same banking that, that people of uh, black people have. And this is why um, these people are getting denied for their mortgages because the most important thing for mortgage for banks is credit. I mean, do you have the credit? Do I think do you I think you're going to pay me back? So if they don't have that credit worthiness, they're they're done. Even if they have the money, if they have all this other things, the credit worthiness really affects them. Um, Great. So that's what it does. Thank you so much, Perry, for that explanation. Aiden. Um, inequality, Opoly, definitely fun game, but uh, eye opening to say the least. I mean, as a white male, a lot of stuff that um, I'm oblivious to that uh, I, I wouldn't know. And, you know, through Perry's extensive research, it's uh, there's some interesting facts, uh, some horrifying stuff, but uh, yeah, def definitely eye opening and uh, new, I would say too. Alberto. So for me, I got a white woman being a Hispanic male myself. It's very different. Um, but at the same time, it puts it into perspective and it kind of shows in a way how someone can work really hard. Someone can do their best in order to go higher in society. And there's going to be different factors that are going to affect them and they're going to complicate their lives. So it's kind of just a luck game, like in this game, whether, you know, life is going to be more complicated for you or it's going to be kind of like a cruising altitude. And Arshia. Yeah, um, I, I played this game a few times at this point and I'm, I'm always kind of struck every single time by the importance of making something as nebulous and large and complex as systemic equity tangible um, or inequity rather tangible. Um, I think people know that that's a thing but they don't really understand how it shows up because you're just living your own identity and your own experience every day. Um, and so I think what I love about inequality Opoly is you can really kind of see that tangibly in different parts of, of a life experience, all the way from being born and getting an inheritance to um, the types of jobs you get and the pay you get and your odds for getting a promotion. I know that that didn't happen today, but I know that's part of it as well. Um, and so I think, and as someone who is a person of color and historically marginalized um, group, part of that, I think it's also important for folks to see um, for me, for example, I don't know the nuances of a black man's life. Um, as much as I can read and learn about it, there's still parts of it that I'll never, there's an upper limit to that. So this kind of a game, this kind of an experience really brings that to the fore um, and creates some more um, knowledge and understanding around that. Um, yeah. Yeah, so one of the things that I thought was really interesting is that now that I've seen and I've I've played the game once, but I've seen others play it, and is that every single time, based on sort of the life circumstance and where you land, each time it's a very interesting way of learning information about new things. So it's not the same information that you're learning every single time based on where you fall and your identity. So I feel like it's a very nuanced and like well all rounded sort of experience of learning something which sort of brings me to me complimenting you Perry that uh, as Aiden has said before the game and setting it up you really needed to do a lot of research on so many topics of diversity equity inclusion and belonging and people's lived experiences so I think that's really what stands out to me that you really had to do the you didn't you didn't have to just research environment and racism you had to do real estate and racism like uh there's just so many aspects to this that you and do you want to comment on that as like a parting note for our guests yeah that's, that's a great parting note i mean i'm talking about my experience with the game i was a hispanic woman and i was disheartened because i began the game with no inheritances at all i was the only one in the game who had no inheritances right and um it hurt <laughs> that was right. fun. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, I mean, thank you so much, everyone, for, for playing this game. I mean, I had a lot of fun making this game. It was a hobby that just, you know, turned into something bigger. And I'm just glad to just play it every time. I'm just always I'm just happy to play it. And, so, and I'm just happy to have everyone with me and have the lesson, the mission of the game, you know, realized to educate people about racism and sexism and how it affects us um, accumulating wealth. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here with us uh, for another episode of Talking Out of Line, Gamification and Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Belonging. Take care, be well, and see you in another episode. Bye.